Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. It has been a long time since I've done a strategic face palm, and I want to start this off by saying I know, mean no offense to the players in this game. I realize that there's some low ranking ones, and hopefully they can take a good round of kidding around and not uh, lose their cool and hopefully learn something from it. For this map, we have a fitting one. If you are the squeamish type or a young child, this is obviously made by Doug, and it is a large bone wearing a bow tie. But for the rest of us normal people, it is a pair of massive dicks. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in and introduce the teams. We've got Shaft M, an appropriate player for this map. He is taking the brilliant red UEF, and if you hear snickering in the background, my wife is actually sitting right across the room from me. Uh, we've got It's Bok Choi, who is taking the orange Aeon. We've got Starter Kit on the front with Cybern, and then on the southern side, we have Poffin. He is taking the brilliant pink Aeon. Lord Castiel as Green Aeon, lots of Aeon in this game, and Wu And. I'm not sure if that is an actual name or a play on words in a language that I do not understand. He is taking the Yellow Seraphim. All of these guys are between 300 and 700 ranks, so let's all have a bit of fun with them, but in the backs of our mind, realize that these guys probably are not super experienced, and let's try to help them out along their way. So we've got a scout coming out first. He is running out into the uh, bow tie, and the ACU following. Now this map, there's really not a whole lot of purpose in running up front. There is no reclaim in the center. All of the reclaim is in the back in the form of rocks, and the only reason to be out in the middle at all are the two mass extractors on the front. There are some expansion islands, a total of six mechs to each side, and then four in the corners. And all of these guys should... Yes, they are all accessible by hover, and these are some massive reclaim rocks out here. Actually, yes, there are reclaim fields on all of the islands so every single one of these is going to be a good one to grab even if you just land engineers for a few seconds and snag that reclaim you got a scout moving around the outside spirit's not going to do any damage at all versus a hunter i mean it's plinking away with one dps but uh yeah even a hunter 65 measly health is going to survive for over a minute against that kind of fire the engineer is going to throw down an auto gun at the front, typical T1 point defense turtling, and that is that for the startup of the game. We got all land factories back here, a single air factory in the rear pinging out a scout, always useful to get some intel, well done shaft, and it's Bok Choi is throwing out an early bomber, five power generators he is probably in a horrific power stall, yes he is, needs six P gens minimum um, to throw that bomber up or five P gens and some really good manual reclaim of these trees that will get you the power that you need throwing out two bombers and continuing on his merry way thankfully he does have a little bit of overflow from his team which is going to mitigate his needs but overall not an extremely good early build I would encourage you to watch some replays of some good players and just watch the first two minutes see what they do with their factory and P gen layout it could help you a lot all right, out here at the front, we got some land factories going down. When I first played this map, I really thought that all this was water because, uh, let's face it, it does look like some kind of liquid, but in reality, it is just white sand. Startlingly, blindingly white sand. So you can walk across it with any kind of unit, which is kind of disconcerting when you first see it. And, uh, yeah, factories on the front is actually a good plan. Single... T1 point defense, however, is not really the best idea because all it takes is one lonely T1 artillery and that thing is out of here, leaving your entire front end wide open. Thankfully, there are a few hunters and a couple of mantis out at the front, but hey, here comes the T1 bombers and those are headed to the ah, T1 mass extractor. That is a kill and probably targeted on the other. Yes, yes, they are. T1 mobile anti-air coming out to try to knock those out of the sky. Southern team definitely needs to get some air online. Yellow is picking it up. We have a transport for green. He is probably getting ready to drop the islands, and he's also shoved the T1 engineer out here into the water to grab those two. Oh, look, landing pad. Did not even realize that that was there. 
some civilian patterns out here. Not any actual civilian buildings, but some patterns. Is that an impassable? No. Okay, so both sides are fully accessible by hover. I don't think... I don't think this is a mirrored map. It kind of looks like it, but there are some fairly significant differences. Maybe not. Maybe it's the lighting. Yellow has already gotten a transport out. He's dropped an engineer here. One on the outside island, and this is actually really good. Well done, Bok Choi. Throwing out those T1 bombers, not so great targeting the T1 mechs. <laughs> you need to grab that engineer before it can lay down a factory. If you kill the engineer, then kill the mechs, then, well, he can't build anything else there, and you've successfully denied that island. However, if you kill off the mass extractors and leave the engineer, well, he builds them right back, and no harm done. On the front end here, Poffin is throwing down a T1 PD of his own just outside of range. So what we have here is a good old fashioned face off across the gulf. Um, yeah, not talking about a whole lot of range since it's only T1 point defense, but hey, have you ever seen a turtle war at this scale? This is just epic proportions right here. We got a T1 artillery firing away at that ACU and they are shortly going to obliterate that auto gun and then chaos may ensue. I do not know. You got three engineers on the outside island throwing down a factory. That is a wise choice. If you have your factory built first, you can throw out tanks and secure the island and kill off any drops <coughs> that are coming in. And uh, yeah, most of these guys actually did a pretty good job of setting up. I've seen some a few problems with the early build orders, but overall not too shabby. Well done, folks. T1 bomber going to kill off the engineer. That is exactly what you want to do. Snag that engineer. Prevent the extra reclaim. Even though the bomber died, I would consider that a win. And then those bombers got killed off on the southern side. Yellow did have enough interceptors up to kill them off. This lonely engineer has built so much, his legs must be so tired from traversing all this distance. Oh, wait. He doesn't have any legs. Oh, well. Um, he's got two mass extractors here, all the way over here to build a sonar, and then all the way up to the northern island. He's actually got mechs, reclaim orders, and then going to the other... Nope, that is a separate move order. My bad, peoples. I thought he was queued up to go over here, but this engineer is actually queued for the reclaim. Red is trying to steal that out from under Green's nose. Actually, Green left his reclaim over here. Need to grab those rocks, buds. Couple hundred a mass in each one of those. Well on your way to a T2 mass extractor if you pick them up. A radar would be a good investment over here. Because we have a shield generator going down. Everybody knows that when you drop a single engineer onto a lonely island, the first thing that you build is a shield. Because shields are important. So that shield is going to go down without any other support. And, uh, yeah... I definitely would have done the factory first. Here come some engineers. At this point, uh, there are guns going up. Those look like three auto guns and three anti-air guns. That should build in time to kill off those engineers. If these engineers would have been about 10 seconds earlier, they could have just reclaimed the T2 engineer before it could do anything, and then they can just sit under the shield. Actually, they could capture the shield and get a free T2 shield right there. But I doubt that's going to happen. Yep, there's the auto gun. Reclaim. Reclaim for your very lives, NGs. And 53 health. <laughs> Scratch the 10 seconds early. If they would have been 3 seconds earlier, that would have been a success. I would have found that extremely hilarious. Red is headed towards the southern side. Going to pull off a drop. There is a land factory down and some tanks out though, so I don't think that's going to be very successful. And red and blue are just kind of poking and prodding at each other. Get it? <laughs> um, they are going to have not enough units on either side really to break through. We've got more land factories for Poffin. He is running wide open on that production and actually has a reasonably well-balanced eco. Only plus... 75 not counting the team overflow and then barely in the green mass wise so I think he could use one more land factory or three or four engineers assisting these and he would be exactly perfectly balanced which is more than a lot of really good players can say there he is dipping a little bit on the power but that is easily salvageable and he is well within his bounds 
This is a radar spoof, my friends. You build five walls in a diamond pattern and everyone assumes that they're point defense. And if you're versus people who aren't scouting, it might actually work. And then they sit there wondering why it's taking so long to kill a point defense that only has 1300 health, when in reality they're killing a 4000 health wall. And all the time, you're basically just sitting there laughing your butt off because everyone else are, is an idiot. It may not be entirely true, but sometimes it is fun to think that way. So we have four and a fifth land factory going down on the island versus a single T2 engineer and a couple of point defense and a highly damaged engineer at that. This may actually be a good thing because there's a bunch of Lobos coming online. It's going to take out those point defenses very easily, especially considering the fact that the power generator that was built first doesn't actually have enough power to run. So, yeah, there's a really good investment of mass for you. But he's going to try to throw up a T2 power generator directly in line with the incoming artillery fire, and maybe that will solve the problem. Kind of doubt it, though. And that is the end of that attempt at an expansion grab. I would highly recommend that Green drop some lower tier units, possibly some combat units, and build a radar first. And then definitely a factory first or second because that would save him a whole bunch of heartache. We got some swift winds and a gunship with another gunship on the way. Looks like T2 Air is out in full swing, at least on the bottom side. We got T1 production going on there, capping off some mexes. Eco, 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 turtle, turtle. And yes, Pink broke down all the point defenses. He has definitely come inside of these and knows that they are dummies. We've got tactical missile defense coming up back here. And the oh so lovely Rhino. These guys are absolutely incredible at knocking out T1 spam on maps such as this, where there is very, very little height change over the map. Rhinos kind of suck because they're so low to the ground and they constantly shoot into the ground if there's rough terrain. But when you have a smooth area like this, they are pretty much the bomb at knocking out T1. Do very, very well, especially versus Auroras. They are going to just mutilate these guys. There's exactly what I was talking about. See, shooting into the ground. Even this relatively flat area and the Cerberus as well. Holy cow. There's not even, <laughs> there's like a 3% grade here, and it's completely throwing most of the targeting. That is hilarious. Okay, now that the tanks are farther back and now moving at an angle, it is able to hit, but my goodness, that's bad when it hits that much ground. All right, three more bombers moving off to the right-hand side, and some more swift winds for Bok Choy. That is going to be T2 air over there, T2 air over here, T2 air for everyone. We've got five, four T2 HQs. Why do you have four headquarters? I do believe that is what support factories were designed for. But to each his own, he is going to try to get a T3 mass extractor, which is actually going to go up relatively well. He's going to mass stall a little bit towards the end of it, but not too shabby, if I do say so myself. Once he finishes that, he can cut on his fourth factory here. He is throwing down another factory, another two factories, preparing for some super hardcore T3 land spam, if he can get an upgrade on it. Hopefully he doesn't get three T3 HQs, because that would just be painful. So much mass wasted. All right, we've got all these useless Lobos out on the island. This is the time for airdrops. We need some transports. If Yellow were a good teammate, he would hand over a couple of these awesome Seraphim T1 transports. Those things have the eight carrying capacity instead of six. Two of those, three of those would be able to hold all of the T1 artillery out there on the island, pick them up, drop them off in one of these bases and watch the horror that unfolds before your very eyes. We've got a T2 transport coming out. This could be interesting. Is he planning an ACU drop? I definitely hope so because I can always use some more entertainment. He does have a good amount of power online. He was upgrading that shield, but paused it. Good dealio. You don't really have enough power in this grid to be pushing a T3 shield. There was a scout overhead which probably spotted 
this T2 transport. We'll just have to see what happens. Building T2 engineers. Maybe it's an NG drop. We've got a second T3 mechs going online. Need to cap that T2. Red is actually on the top of the production charts. He has 90 mass income, which is a 30, yes, no, 20 mass advantage over the next highest person. And 1.6k power income, which is going to be 200 higher. So he's actually situated in a very, very nice position, mostly thanks to owning uh, the entire corner expansion on this side, one island, and then another half of island, soon to be a whole island. And he is actually doing a fantastic job on his expansions. He's got two T2 mechs in the back, which is the safest position that he has. Uh, that is not already upgraded on Mexus, and he's thrown down a land factory on this tiny little sliver of land, which is going to allow him to pump out units and deny anything that gets thrown over here at this little patch of dirt. He does need to pick up the rock for reclaim, though. Do not forget your reclaim. Always pick up your reclaim. And yes, there is an engineer out here reclaiming rocks, so he does see them. Hopefully, he will pick them up. All right, we have an Oblivion turret down. That is going to be firing away at these units. That is a point defense creep thanks to two engineers. Although it doesn't look like much of a creep. Ah, there's the other one. So there's one single engineer fronted by some auroras throwing down those point defense, which is actually not a bad setup. The turrets are going to fire at the closer units before they fire at the other point defense, unless they're manually targeted. And hopefully, especially since I don't really... There's a radar. Never mind. He does have radar coverage. Um, he is actually going to be able to move forward very, fairly well with that point defense creep. Now, something about the Oblivions. You can actually do this with UEF, too. Um, it, either of the turrets that have area of effect. Ah, there go the two. You know what? Earlier, I misspoke. Red has the artillery, not the southern team. So that entire thing that I said earlier was actually a strategic face palm of my own because I didn't even have my team color straight. Red is doing exactly the right thing, building transports to load up his unused units and then drop them on the enemy team. Well done, Shaft. I am impressed. You really pounded that one home. On this side, the Oblivion turrets, if you build them right outside the range of the other turret, so you would be building it approximately right there. So your range ring ended right about there. Neither the Cerberus nor the Seraphim point defense can hit your turret because they don't have AOE and they're too far away. But you can ground fire the Oblivion or the UEF turret, whatever it's called. I forget what it is. Um, you can ground fire them right on the edge of that ring, like right there and the area of effect will kill the turret. So you can actually outrange the other um, the other faction's T2 point defense, which is kind of hilarious and incredibly frustrating depending on the side of the situation that you're in. Now when you have all this build power here and you have a little bit of extra mass in the bank, although you're about to hit negative, so it is more vital now, you can throw all of these units to assist that uh, TML and that will increase the build time and launch things quicker and here comes the drop let's prepare for hilarity over here we have tort bombers in the base and that is basically the only offensive unit over here outside of the ACU tons of Lobos hitting the ground those are immediately going to rain fire and brimstone down upon that poor innocent anti-air turret uh, obviously these were not manually targeted until yeah because they're gonna auto well I don't know he may have specifically targeted the anti-air that actually would not have been a bad idea because the T2 transports do have a relatively respectable gun on them so they will be able to stay in the area and do damage also interesting point of fact UEF T2 transports do very well versus interceptors you can they can defend themselves versus one I know uh, possibly two interceptors I'm not entirely sure uh, but they do a very good job with their own anti-air for the mass that they cost and they have a decent ground gun so they're not actually bad attack units to leave with your units that you just drop and that is a brilliant targeting solution right there killing off the t2 power that is a horrendous loss anytime you lose a high tier power generator and this poor guy has a t3 
air factory, which he is not going to be able to run in any capacity because he does not have any power. He has 500 power income, which is not anywhere near enough to push T3 air. I've got two cruisers out, which is awesome for Wu and he's also got a couple of destroyers out there to protect them. We've got Wagner's trying to get in the water, but they're just getting zapped off by those destroyers before they can even come close. And that cruiser is going to be able to kill off any of these point defenses, preventing the advancement of the units. We've also got a cruiser from Poffin. Now the Aeon Cruiser is going to have awesome anti-air, but not a whole lot more than that. So if you're going to build units, which he's not, I would build destroyers because then you can send them around the backside and penetrate from the rear. Now we've got the T3 Air Factory on the northern side as well, but this guy does have resource allocation, so that's going to be no problem whatsoever pushing out air units. And he is looking like he's getting T3 maybe? It's either T3 or second RAS. I can't tell if that's chest or left arm. It looks like left arm, maybe. We'll see when it finishes. We will see what it is. So we got yellow subs up here. These are the Seraphim subs, which are very bad at killing things. Although apparently, I do need to try out. I heard a lot of people saying on the forum, and well, not a lot, two or three people saying on the forum, and in the comment section that apparently the type of torpedo defense that the Seraphim subs have and the agility of the sub allows them to dodge torpedoes, which is news to me. I'm going to have to watch those replays and try it out for myself and report back on my findings. But if you just sit them still and let them fire back and forth with other subs, they have 200 less health than the other subs do, so it's pretty obvious which one wins. It is interesting that that element of... Um, of micro is included in that though because the Seraphim Navy is incredibly micro intensive all the time. We've got a huge horde of T2 gunships. You know what? Let's refer to them as crows. Uh, groups of crows are called murders, so we're going to call this a murder of gunships. It is moving over here to eliminate that land factory and then all of the units on that island depleting the resources of Shaft M, knocking him down to a paltry 142 even though that is still higher than anyone else. 20 higher to be exact. He's also missing a couple of mass extractors out here. He's got two artillery. That must have been the work of the gunships. And we've got a NG drop in the back which is throwing up a T2 air factory. So we do have an established uh, an established base of operations up here. I don't know why that is a T2 air though. That is extremely odd. I would have gone land, so at least, at least that way I could get some combat units out to defend myself. Very, very odd choices all around. But I guess that's why this is a strategic facepalm. So the cruisers are doing work. They've got a couple of mass extractors down. They're starting to eat into the base of Orange, but he does have a T3 torpedo bomber. Solus is amazing as always against any form of cruiser. It's going to be a one-hit kill. Kaboom! Nicely done. And another bomber will be a one-hit kill on this cruiser. And that is all she wrote. That is probably the work of this serpentine, I would imagine. Possibly even these two. Not entirely sure. Those two may be in range. Let's check ourselves here. Nope. This map is bigger than I thought it was. Yeah. Okay, so this does reach into the base. Very nice, very nice. Apparently, Sea Dongs is the same 20 kilometers as Seton's Clutch. Alright, so this one cruiser. I'm gonna slowly peg away at whatever used to be there. Probably an engineer. Horrible way to die. Um. A Seraphim T2 cruiser can be denied by a single... Oh, that's not... Get your bombs off. Get your torpedoes off. Nope. That bomber definitely had a bad case of the blue balls. Um, you can deny a T2 cruiser with a single TMD. Seraphim cruisers missiles have one health as opposed to UEF, which has two health and is basically specifically designed to overwhelm attack defense. 
Um, the, the Seraphim Cruiser is relatively easy to deny with a shield and a couple of TMD, you're just going to be impenetrable. Um, so right now, I don't know why he's not throwing up TMD, but that needs to happen. Also, the Torpedo Bomber, if you wing around the outside edge and come in from the C angle, you will be able to kill off that cruiser no problemo and uh, not have the failed passes that we were experiencing from this side because the torpedoes drop on the land and torpedoes don't really work on land at least until they come up with boring torpedoes and I think that's a little ways off. So we've got a point defense going up. This is progress because we have a T2 point defense which will outrange the T1 artillery but still no land factory and need to go after the mexes. Alrighty then. Oh, also, well, there's air flying overhead, so they will be scouted. We need radar. We need radar badly. There's the T2 radar system. It's like he's reading my mind. Red has T3 online. That is a strap bomber we just watched zip away, followed by a second. Oh, that, I thought that was a car alarm. Good deal. I thought I was about to have to cut my mic. So, Strap bombers, unaccompanied by any other air, may seem like a bad thing, but when your opponent only has a handful of ASF, these are likely going to get a couple of passes before anybody realizes what's going on. And ambassadors, is that what these are? Yes, ambassadors can do a whole lot of damage very, very quickly if they're scouted ahead of and actually drop a bomb, which is apparently not the case in this situation. They have very good area of effect with high enough damage to kill a T2 mass extractor in one pass. So, here it comes again. Let's try this a second time. Is that turning off to the edge? No, it's move order, move order, move order, move order. Dude, you gotta place an attack order. What are you doing? Two strap bombers. And they're just gonna get thrown away, I think. Ah, there's a bomb. Finally. Killing off a T2 mass extractor and strap bomber down. Definitely not worth it. Maybe if it killed this one and killed the T3 engineers and the three quarter finished T3, that would actually pay for the strap bomber. But as it was, that was an epic fail. We got hover tanks out here in the middle, dying in droves to the cruiser, standing still, the high AOE on those missiles, killing two or three at a time. And there they go. Frigates moving in to finish off the mess. Of course, the frigates will outrange blazes, and the blazes are doing a horrific thing. They're actually firing at one of the false radar blips that the UEF frigates generate. I hope you guys saw that. Uh, once they moved in range to sight an actual frigate, the targeting will switch, <clears throat> but when they didn't have radar coverage, they were firing at the blip out in the middle of nowhere. So that is what jamming is useful for, guys. I know a lot of people question the usefulness of jamming, whether or not it is a good thing to have on a unit or whether it's just kind of a waste, one of those useless abilities, but it does actually deny a bit of damage, especially if you're dealing with torpedo units. It's almost like having tor anti-torpedo flares. The torpedoes go after the false blips, they kind of spin around in a second because there's actually nothing there to kill, and then they just die. Makes excellent, excellent, um, uh, an excellent defense. Totally lost my train of thought there. Holy cow. The other thing is, like, the Cybran gunships that have jamming. When that false radar blip passes in front of the gunships, you can actually... Ooh. Is that going to be a death? Is that going to be a death? Nope. Nothing. Yay for false passes! I have no idea what that was, but that was an excellent waste of five or six trap bombers. <laughs> um, the SAM launchers will fire at the false radar blip running in front of the whaler and actually waste their entire first volley on that false blip which is amazing because a lot of the SAMs have a decently long over uh, reloading time. So that's a huge amount of damage that is just completely wasted. You can get in your gunships a lot easier that way. So we've got shields going up for Wu and he is going to protect his power generators if at all possible. And hopefully his ACU as well because that, uh, that strap bomber pass was surely very terrifying even though it was completely and totally a miss. Actually, that works on two fronts. 
High level English puns, yay! Caesar going down in the back, or a czar, depending on your literary preferences. I think it is a czar. A lot of people have made that point, and I'm going to go with that. So the czar is a building in the back. It is about 20%, and it will surely fall upon someone's skull very shortly. The donut is only good for two things. Being a mass donation and falling on top of ACUs and murdering them amid much hilarity. So we'll have to see which one of those this one files under. Where are the strat bombers that I saw stacking up just a minute ago? They are on the northern side, killing off the expansion. Finally, a good use of strat bombers. We've got T3 torpedo bombers eating away at these naval units over here. And we're up to 36% on that. No major SAM emplacements. I think the seas are... Yes, the Tsar should be able to defend itself against that many ASF. It's going to be close, but it'll take a long time for those to kill it, and I think in the meantime, the Tsar will vet up and inevitably kill the ASF. So we've got Strat Bombers winging around up here. No T3. There's a couple of flak emplacements, which are not very good at killing Strat Bombers. If, the, if he were to select all of the Strat Bombers and throw them in at once, but have much better chance of killing this off before the strap bomber dies. And we've got a T3 sub versus a Cooper. And I hate to say it, but the Cooper is going to win that one. You can see the amazing torpedo defense on that Cooper, not taking a single hit from that T3 sub and doing a whole lot of damage. Bring that Cooper back down in line. A group of Coopers paired with a mobile shield, the Bulwark, the mighty UEF unit. And holy cow, there's a Monkey Lord in mid, and I totally missed it. There's the bright, shiny laser. It's going to fry the faces off those T2 tanks and then cross the white mass. Ew, you don't want to touch that. Get back. Eh, yeah, he's going to skirt along the edge. Yeah, he's going to stop. Nobody wants to walk through that. And gunships inbound. Got a stream of T1 scouts headed across just to see what's cooking on the other side. And yes, he is going to dive in all the way. He is going to move towards the back, and there is nothing in his path that can stop him. There's a GC kind of half-heartedly being constructed back here by a single engineer. Where all the mass thrown on that, it might finish in time to stop the Monkey Lord. But it is approaching too late. There it goes, the firebase. And here come the bricks and trebuchets. This may be the folding point for the southern team. It looked like they were making a bit of a comeback with this navy on this side and some of the other things that were going on. But Red is going to re-secure that northern expansion with the strap bombers. And then this monkey lord to the face is kind of a brutal thing to shrug off. That monkey lord's vetted up a couple of times already. And it is moving forward. Let's check on it exactly. It is on four vets. So it's got one more veterancy ahead of it to gain a little bit more health. There are some Harbingers desperately, desperately needs some radar because if it can't see what it's going after, it can't kill it. And it's going to die a horrible, painful death without having accomplished anything. Here comes some Strat Bombers. And no, I think that Monkey Lord's going to die. It's at 4,800 health and rapidly falling to that oblivion and the gunships. And what is this? What is this? Hopefully those are Rambo comms and not the actual ACU flying directly over the cruiser. But who cares? It's got a shield on that transport. Shield down, though. Yes, it is SACU's dual Rambo comms. That is going to be brutal. Nothing back here that can deal with that. I think Green is about to die a horribly painful death. Those Rambo comms are just going to eat through that base. There's no transports to let this ACU get away. Got to run in. He has spotted the ACU. Going to throw down a Ravager. Or no, that's not a Ravager. That is a T3 anti-air trying to prevent these uh, strap bombers from killing it, but here come some restores as well. I wish he would have chased it. If he would have chased down the ACU, he would have killed it easily, easily. But as things stand, he is still going to kill off the T3 air factory. He's got a T3 power generator that's probably going to go down. 
and a whole lot of damage done to this base. I think this is going to be the collapsing point of the southern team unless a miracle happens. Shield is down on this commander. It is down. And a little bit left on this one. That is the power generator down. The other T3 air factory. If he can kill this one before he dies, I would focus fire it. There would be no more T3 for green and just about the entire base killed. So it's not literally a pair, player kill. Oh, the last bullet from the SACU killed the air factory. That is fantastic. It's not literally a player kill, but he effectively removed this player. So it is good enough for all intents and purposes. We've got a Soul Ripper from Blue, and it is going to die horribly. Oh, Sam's. Sam's to the rescue. Fly back to the safe point, Soul Ripper. That GC is alive. It is coming forward, but that Soul Ripper has been pounding on it the whole way. And it is going to go down before it does any damage. The Monkey Lord actually survived. Got into the water with 14k health. So as it sits, the southern team is not decimated by any means, but they're definitely not out of their problems. They're down to two ecos versus three. The north has better eco on most parts, except for um, bok choy. Oh no, Bok Choy is on the north. I'm sorry, I was looking at Poffin. Poffin does have a fairly good eco here. It's pulling 197 with a little bit extra from a blip of reclaim here and there. So not too shabby, my friend. Not too bad at all. And he does have a torrent out. So that is going to be able to do some more pestering. That is the one bad thing here. The northern side is losing badly on air control or on naval control, my bad. They do have air control, I think think, especially since Yellow lost almost all his ASF to these SAMs, and they're making excellent use of loads of T3 torpedo bombers, so kudos to them for that. But they do need to get some ASF over here to eliminate these swift winds, because if they could get rid of those and force the cruisers as a primary target, that would be the end of it. Yellow would have no more navy, but as it stands... All of these are going to get killed off. Restore is trying to bump up and do some damage, but they are going to get chased off by all those Sams. There's the Czar. Finally, the donut is on its way. And that is going to be paired with a Megalith and a Soul Ripper. Bad times for the Southern team. Very, very bad times. All these Harbingers just getting eaten by the Megalith. Walking forward to become part of the buffet. Aircraft... The Tsar is going to take some fairly heavy damage from all these restorers and the cruiser that it passed over. But there's the ASF trying to attack those restorers, and I think it is going to be okay. There's an aircraft carrier and a cruiser here. Is going to miss with the beam. Holy cow. Watch your directional ability, and it's going to be a mass donation. We were wondering which one it would be, and there it is. That was... Very exceptionally badly placed move orders. Like, I don't think that Tsar actually killed anything. I don't see any naval wrecks up here. That may be one. Okay, maybe one cruiser. So it's got to kill there. And it killed a few aircraft. And it killed a factory and some engineers where it fell. And now the southern team is going to reclaim it and build a Galactic Colossus. So that's where we're at, folks. <laughs> that is what I meant by it being a naval donation. We got the Megalith moving out into the water. This is going to be a royal pain for this navy. It's going to easily deal with these destroyers if they're not withdrawn. Immediately going to kill off that cruiser, kill off that destroyer and then wade into the water where it does a very fine job of eliminating things with torpedoes. There you go, right there. There is no reason to withdraw from anything torpedo based with a megalith aside from a huge swarm of T2 or T3 um, subs. The megalith can hold its own in the water and not only that, it moves faster in the water than it does on land. So there is no reason whatsoever 
do not put the megalith in the water, especially considering the fact that when you're in shallow water like this, it can also leave its shoulder cannons exposed so that it can hit the navy no problemo. There's a battleship, which the megalith can easily go toe-to-toe -to -toe with if it's not kiting around the outside edge and taking damage without returning any. Why? Why are you handling your experimentals in such a fashion? We have T3 subs. These... I heard an explosion. What was explodey? Uh, SACU maybe? Yes. An SACU, I think. It is so hard to see with that blinding white there. Megalith taking strat bombers and interceptors trying to go after <laughs> the Soul Ripper, which is basically just vet food. These strategic subs out here are loading for nukes. Let's take a look at the eco. And he is power stalling like a mofo. That is not where you want to be. He's got 4K to 6K uh, power deficit, which means that he needs to be, there we go, pausing his air, building more pgens, and stopping everything else until he gets it done. And there's the T3 sub hunters, which, yes, the strategic subs are going to be able to get out without taking any damage or getting sighted. And the torpedo bombers are going to take care of them. Nicely handled, Orange. Way to be a team player. Now, strat bombers up on the north side. Those are going to go down horrifically to those Flak and Sams. Yes, those are Sams. All right. Not too shabby. And we got a Yathatha coming up. That is from Yellow, who has built it in the back of his base and sending it up through the water. That means it's going to be relatively hidden until it hits units up here, but I don't think it's actually going to be able to do any significant amount of damage. The Megalith is gone, so it doesn't have to deal with that, but it still has to deal with the Soul Ripper and the Rambo comms out in front, which actually have paused shields because Red is trying to get more power up. It is a noble cause for him to undertake, but it is kind of messing with his combat capabilities. And we have a group of Harbingers and a Galactic Colossus coming in as well. So this may actually work. Only the chicken's going around the back. Actually, that may not be a bad thing. If the chicken can get in on the back side, the only thing defending is this group of... Well, there's two groups of T2 point defense and some what this guy is fortifying the rear portion of his base why why you turtle so hard i don't understand there's so much mass there that could have been put into other things <laughs> for all of the cost of all of these point defense and artillery he probably could have finished that czar I don't, I don't know. I don't know sometimes. That chicken is going to come up, though. It is going to rip into these fortifications, and they're actually going to do their job. Nice. I do believe that was a lot of mercies. You could see them impacting the Athatha, along with the Miasmas and all of those Oblivions going to take care of the chicken on that very short walk and the lightning storm is going to be left in the base but honestly it's not going to do too much damage just kind of hitting a whole lot of nothing zapping a structure here and there and it's done so hey the mass donation was sent to the south and now it's right back up to the north again we got harvey's shredding this sacu i say shredding but it still has its shield up Strategic never mind launch. i thought the shield was still paused on these and there's a nuke Oh, where, oh, where could the Strategic nuke be launch going? Detected. A second nuke. Those are... Where are we at? I'm assuming that was probably the subs, but I don't actually see... Very strange. Let me check chat here. Nothing. Okay, so why is strategic launch detected, but I don't actually see a nuke? Very, very odd. I have not gotten a desync message. Perhaps it was a glitch, or, you know, it could be a thing with the replay 
where these guys were targeted for a nuke if they're loaded and it just hasn't launched yet. We shall keep an eye, folks. More odd things happening in the strategic face palm. Honestly, this game has gotten massively confusing. Okay, so we got the GC, which was shredding this base up here, which I'm sure you guys were paying attention to, because I was kind of panned over it with the camera, even though I was focused on other things. And there's a Monkey Lord clearing out the bottom end, so T4s all over the place on this map with air units attacking them. You can see we got Mercies on the north side, along with the Tsar, which is going to kill off that Galactic Colossus. And then we got Strat Bombers galore, along with an Awasa, for good measure. That Monkey Lord actually got all the way back up to full health. Uh, between the fifth and final veterancy and all of the time it spent on regen out in the water So that was actually a pretty nice monkey lord until all of this hit it and now it's gonna go down Bye bye monkey, but it did clear out green again down to the last power generator So all green has is this t3p gen over here and no mass no mexes nada We've got a Ravager creep over here for this Rambocom. Nicely done there, although these Harbingers will probably be able to deal with it should they push all the way up if they stop on the move order right there. That would be incredibly sad, but they're all just going to die a horribly painful death because they're not going to be in range of anything. And then on the right-hand side, we've got a Czar once again headed towards cruisers. Need to back that thing up. And there it goes. Actually, there was only one cruiser. Two cruisers. Could have killed that. Oh, well not a big dealio okay so those were launched the nukes were launched and I'm assuming that the nuke defense caught it and for some reason either the strategic uh, the strategic nuke symbol did not display on the nukes or I completely and totally missed it which may actually be the case considering the brilliant blinding white mass in the center of this map so the harbingers are going to go ahead and kill that SACU and wail away on these Ravagers and almost kill all of them but that last one there is just going to keep plinking away there is a T3 mobile already trained on it that will probably kill it in just a minute but uh, yeah it's gonna kill well must be no radar coverage it is a multitude of fails that is what this is yep no radar coverage so the Ravager could have killed several Harbingers by now but it's just not going to so we got a T4 bomber coming in on the base. Bomber's going to take out the shields, and here come the strats. That is hopefully headed for the ACU because I am ready to be done with this mess. At ah, nope, P-Gens. Because, of course, P-Gens are the target. There's Shaft's ACU. Hopefully he saw the ACU as he was coming past. Those four strat bombers would have been enough, but now the shield is back up. There they go on more P-Gens. That is going to force him into a power stall most likely because of all of those nuke subs. Nope, he is somehow still maintaining. Is it overflow from the team? Yes, it is. He's pegged at zero, pulling maximum power from everything and everyone. He is going to be power stalled very soon if he's not careful. T3 Torpedo is going to shred these naval units on this side. And I'm going to bump up the speed on this one again. Strat Bombers moving to the south. Please, someone kill an ACU. Maybe this will be it. There's the Czar going to close in on these ASF. Pink actually has a decent amount of ASF. Strat Bombers away. Going for the nuke defense, I think. Possibly. Yes, Blue saying, find the ACUs. Thank you. That is exactly what you need to do. Czar is going to knock out the nuke defense, so that is one plus. Whole bunch of engineers going to vet up on those. Battleship plinking away at this base, and those naval units not going to get a whole lot of success. Hopefully that thing gets mercy. I haven't seen a naval unit mercyed in a very, very long time. It would be hysterical to watch. And the donut is... Oh no! <laughs> There's a Telemazer! Oh my word, Orange almost killed his teammate with the Zard drop. <laughs> that is fantastic. Holy smokes. I thought the donut was going to drop directly on top of him. 
That was almost the epitome of epic fail. But no, it didn't happen. All right, green is going to take a bow. Pink is still in the running, but I think that is the death knoll for the Southern team. Finally, this ludicrous mess of a game is going to be over. Hopefully, the guys who played this will watch, and they will take it to heart. Some area. Ah, there we go. Finally, we get to see some nukes. Those are headed for the base. The ACU is standing like 300 yards from the nuke subs, and the base is nuked. Does Red even know that it's there? No, he doesn't. There's an ACU right there. Right there. Could have nuked it. Oh well. <laughs> Hopefully these guys can take some good advice from this. If you can learn from any game, it doesn't matter how bad it was, it was a good game. So hopefully they will do so. Tempest is on 200 health and for some reason is still being allowed to take shots. There it goes. Kaboom. But it is down. And there is Blue's ACU kind of teleporting around trying to clean things up. We need something to kill this. There are destroyers over, or Coopers rather, over here. Coopers would be perfect for this job. That they could simply move right there. Move over there. Why does no one have sonar? That is the better question. Is there any sonar? There's torpedoes. There's a sonar. It's a T2 sonar. All the way in the back. But it is a sonar. And there they go. Finally. Going to find this ACU and end this game. Being pinged, he didn't even know that it was there. He just stumbled upon it by random chance. But that is going to be the end of Poffin the Mighty. The center player for Sidong's clutch. And the end of this game. Alrighty guys, hopefully you stuck with me through the whole thing and enjoyed it. I find games like this kind of fun and funny. Oh wow. Pink was actually running over the middle. That might have actually done something had that not ended the game right there because there's no T4s. There's a couple of Rambo comms, and that's it. That would have actually been difficult to deal with for these guys. Anyway, all that aside, the game is over. That is it. Replay done. Cast done. I am out of here. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please send me replays on odd maps. Maybe not necessarily this one, but odd maps nonetheless. And I will see you guys in the next cast.